we're so glad that you could join us for service today. So wherever you are, why don't you rise to your feet and join us as we celebrate Jesus. Come on, let me see your hands like this. Put your hands together. Come on, hey. Here we sing. So many things, they fight for my attention. So I shift my gaze in your direction. Hey, I look to you, God, oh, even when the clouds are rolling in. Yeah, I live for you, God, oh, even when my world is gaining. I choose you. Come on, tell him. I choose you. No matter when and over again, I choose you. But overall, but overall, I choose to follow Jesus. Hey, I look, hey, I look to you, God. Oh, even when the clouds are rolling in, hey, I live for you, God. Oh, even when my world is king. I choose you, I choose God. Hey, I choose you. So 
Tell him how grateful you are. He's an amazing God. <laughs> oh, we bless your name, Jesus. Come on, let's sing these words together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Come on, sing who could. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? Down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Came the morning, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. One more time we sing, then came. The morning come on declare that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the
God of hope. So we're going to pray together. Put your hope in Jesus today. Come on, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we look to you. You are the God of all hope. With you, nothing is impossible. And with you, there is always hope because you can turn difficult situations around for our good and for your glory. So Jesus, I commit your people into your hands, no matter what they're going through. The mountains that they face, the giants that stand before them, whether it is financial, whether it is an illness, whether it seems to be something difficult standing in their way, no matter what is ahead of them, you who is the God of all hope, we put our trust in you and we know that you will meet us at our point of need. Lord, receive the glory and receive the honor when our mountains melt like wax, when our giants fall down, when our enemies are dispersed, we will lift up our eyes and say, look what the Lord has done. We give you the glory and we give you the honor for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen. And amen and amen. Wow, wow. He's the God of hope. Put your trust in Him today. Such a joy to worship Jesus with you. In case there's someone next to you, give them a fist bump and let them know that they're welcome into the presence of God. And you may have your seats right now. Such a joy to worship Jesus together. I hope that you have been reading the scriptures that were up on the website this week as you prepare uh, for our summon series. Uh, Jesus is coming back. What a critical message in such times. And so I want us to get ready for the Word. Are you excited for God's Word? Yeah. Come on, will you put your hands together and welcome Pastor Gary as he brings God's Word to us today. We get caught up in our own lives and forget what's most important to us. Not realizing how the entire world can change in a split second. all over the country and even internationally. Hong Kong, England, Russia are much the same.
Welcome. Great to see you again. Well, I can't see you, but I know you can see me. Great to, to have you with us today as we continue this wonderful series of messages about Jesus coming back. And today we're going to look at the greatest sign of the return of the Lord Jesus, the nation of Israel. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, make your word very clear to us, very plain to us. Help us to see that you're a God of miracles. You're the God of prophecy. You know the end from the beginning. You've declared it all in your word. and You've made it known to us so we can be ready. Anoint your servant as he preaches today. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. As we begin today, I want to read a couple of scripture verses. First of all, from Luke chapter 21, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day, the day that Jesus comes back, will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And then in Luke chapter 21, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and this is what he said about the nation of Israel. They, Israel, will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You know, just before that portion of scripture, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. And he said this in Luke chapter 23, verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The greatest sign of the any moment return of Jesus is what happens to the miracle nation called Israel. We're in the middle of this series. We started two weeks ago. We said from the Bible, the prophetic book, Jesus is coming back. It's the Bible's main theme. It's bold. It's emphatic. Jesus was coming the first time. He's coming again. And he's coming to put an end to the madness of this world. He's coming to take his people back to himself. He's coming to restore Israel. He's coming to judge all men and all nations. And he's coming to set up his eternal kingdom of peace. Last week, we looked at some of the signs, <clears throat> specifically the moral, the mental, and the spiritual state of our world. On the earth, nations in anguish and perplexity, an increase of wickedness. The love of most will go, grow cold. There will be terrible times in the last days, or rather, Paul tells us that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Our world is more confused, scared, wicked, corrupt, and lawless than ever before. People are cold and indifferent to the things of God. The nations are far, far away from, the lo from loving and honoring Jesus, the creator and the sovereign Lord of life. But Jesus is coming back. And as we're looking at the signs of the end, we, we, we went to the book of uh, Matthew. Because in Matthew and in Luke and in Mark, Jesus, we have a record of Jesus in the temple with his disciples. In Matthew, it says Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, three questions. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age? When will this happen? First, it was a reference to the temple. When will the temple, the breaking, every stone broken down, when will this happen? And just 40 years after Jesus said these words, the Roman Emperor Titus came in in 60 AD and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And Jesus' words that the house of Jerusalem would be left desolate was fulfilled. A million Jews killed. What were the signs of your coming? And he had already told them that he was going to come back. He was going to go to heaven and prepare a place. He'd come back and take them to be with him. They said, what are the signs that this will happen? What's the signs of the end of the age? And of course, some of these signs were immediate, but some were future. 
There were many different signs, and we saw that with the moral and the mental and the spiritual state of the wicked, false Christs, wars, revolutions. And then he said, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes, famine, and so on. Other prophets, Daniel and Isaiah and Paul, include many other signs, increase of travel and knowledge, apostasy, a flood of wickedness, scoffers, the Antichrist, a worldwide political, economic, spiritual system on the verge of happening. In verse 12, he said, before all these things would be a terrible time of judgment for Israel. Why? Because he knew that they would reject him. Included in what Jesus talked about was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, the scattering of the nation of Israel. This would happen in the lifetime of the disciples. And thirdly, a period that Jesus called the time of the Gentiles. <clears throat> First was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Jesus announced it. Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies. Believers should run away. <clears throat> An emperor, interesting, the emperor Titus besieged the city for a time and then he withdrew. And history tells us that many believers were spared death by fleeing from the city, listening to the words of Jesus. Josephus, Israel's greatest historian, tells of the terrible cannibalism by the Jews during the siege that led up to the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. In the book of Deuteronomy, we're given a list of the blessings and curses that will come to the nation of Israel for their faithfulness or their failure. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord will bring against you a nation from far away from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you are destroyed. <clears throat> they will leave you no grain, new wine or oil, nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will, this is Old Testament. Deuteronomy, they will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all of the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. Because of the suffering that your enemy will afflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters the Lord is, your God has given to you. And this is exactly what happened during the Roman siege of Jerusalem because the Jews had rejected Jesus. And Jesus in chapter 21 of Luke, verse 24 said, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And this is exactly what happened. Just 40 years after Jesus announced that Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, the Jewish people were scattered to all the nations around the world Israel would cease to exist as a nation. Jerusalem would be under the control of Gentiles. Jesus said, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that's exactly what happened. And what happens to Israel is such an important subject because it's the subject of the Bible. And I want to talk about that to help you understand the miracle nation of Israel is the greatest sign. You see, the Bible is a Jewish book. The whole Bible has been given to us by Jewish people. All 66 books were written by Jewish people. All of the Bible is an account of God's dealings with his covenant people, the nation of Israel. <clears throat> Gentiles don't figure prominently in either the Old or the New Testament. The Gentile blessing in the New comes from the failure of Israel in the Old. The Gentile blessing in the New comes from that. Even the book of Revelation deals primarily with God's wrath being poured out on Israel in the end times to bring her back to himself. Almost all the events of the Bible take place within the borders of Israel by Jewish people. 90% of the people in the New Testament are Jews. Jesus was an Israelite. That's not just confined to his time here on earth. Jesus is described in heaven as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the son of David. When he was crucified, the inscription above his head on the cross was king of the Jews. The ultimate destination <clears throat> for every believer, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 tells us, is the city without foundations whose architect and builder is God. 
In Revelation 21, that city is described to us. Its gates are inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> On its foundations are the names of the 12 apostles, all Jews. The Bible is a record of the nation and the history of Israel written as history and prophecy. We cannot understand the Bible or prophecy or God's plan for the ages without understanding God's miracle nation called Israel. And it begins with a covenant. So let me give you that story. All God's dealings with men are based upon a covenant, a contract, a will, a testament. There are two covenants, the old and the new. The old begins with the Abrahamic covenant, God's covenant with Abraham. God chooses sovereignly to make Abraham the father of the nation of Israel and as a result, the father of many nations. He chooses to bless all the nations through Abraham and consequently through Israel, all nations. Genesis chapter 12, <clears throat> the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to the land, I will show you. Listen to what he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And on all people on earth will be blessed through you. And then in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 to 7, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Mor Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So God makes a covenant with Abraham. Notice it's I will. It's unconditional. There are no ifs, ands, or buts attached to it. God will do this. A great nation and specific land for the nation. In Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 to 17, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had parted from them, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. God gave Abraham and his descendants, the people of Israel, the land of Palestine as an internal inheritance forever. In Genesis chapter 15, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your and your descendants, I give you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. God specified the land area. And it doesn't matter what happens throughout history. That land is special land, the holy land, God's land. Incidentally, in verse 13, God tells Abraham that his descendants will live for 400 years in Egypt as slaves and come out with great possession. It's exactly what happened. Genesis chapter 17. Read that chapter if you would, but in verses 7 to 8. I will establish, I will, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between you and me, me and you, and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. So God made a covenant with Abraham. An everlasting, unconditional covenant. In Genesis chapter 22, after Abraham offered Isaac, God said this to Abram. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So God made an Abrahamic covenant, and a covenant with Abraham. Secondly, it was the Palestinian covenant. He made this with Moses. In Genesis 29, Moses tells the people of Israel to keep the terms of the covenant. Now, there are conditions here to the Palestinian covenant, unlike the Abrahamic, which had no conditions. 
He warns them if they fail God, they will be uprooted from the land and the land will lie waste. But if they return to God, he will return them to the very same land. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 6, when all these blessings and curses I've set before you come on you and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey me with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scatters you, even if you have been banished to the most distant place land on the earth. From there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Wow. He will bring you back to that land that belonged to your fathers and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and your soul so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. It was not just a restoration to the land, but a spiritual restoration. On the basis of these covenants with Israel, he would do two things, bring them back to the very same land and bring revival. You can also see this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where the curses for disobedience would include exile to the nations and great trouble that they would have there. All of this happened in the history of the nation of Israel. There's one further covenant. It's the new covenant. It's in Jeremiah chapter 31. God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah of a future and a final restoration of Israel to the land of Palestine after an exile. It would include a spiritual revival. Israel and Jerusalem would be secure forever. It's obviously future because after the rejection of Jesus, the Messiah, the temple, Jerusalem, Israel would be destroyed. The Jews would be scattered until the times of the Gentiles is over. So this is a promise of a future restoration and a revival as far as the disciples would see it, as far as Jeremiah would see it. But living from our perspective, we're now beginning to look back. Has this happened? Well, on the basis of these eternal unconditional covenants, God establishes the nation of Israel, the land it possesses, Palestine, David's throne and the kings who would rule over it, his son forever. The city of Jerusalem is the capital city of the world. He establishes the people will be scattered because of their sin, but they will be returned. And God would pour out spiritual revival. And he confirms that he will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who oppress them. This is the Bible. It's a book about Israel, about the Jewish people. This has all been fulfilled. Israel has a unique historical record. She has an eternal covenant with God. She was oppressed in Egypt, but mightily delivered. She was in the wilderness for 40 years, but she was brought into the promised land, the same land, Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Only Joshua and Caleb made it. The nation was established as a kingdom. Saul, David, and Solomon were the kings, David the greatest. And then because of their sin, there was a dividing of the nation of Israel. The sinful kings of Judah, the southern tribes, and Israel, the northern tribes. They disobeyed God. Isaiah talks about it. Many of the prophets in the Old Testament talk about the Babylonian captivity. And in 722, the 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 northern kingdoms were captured by the Assyrians. In 586, Judah went into Babylon. They were exiled. Jerusalem was broken. Daniel is in Babylon for 70 years in exile. And it's an amazing book about the future of Israel. You need to read it. That's why I've asked you if you would read it. He talks about not only the problems in his day, but future days. He promises that they would return and rebuild Jerusalem. They did. There was 400 years of silence. And then Zerubbabel's temple was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes. It was captured by Pompey, a Roman, after Judas Maccabees who was a Jewish rebel. And then Herod had the temple rebuilt. You can see all of this trouble for the nation of Israel because of their rejection. And then we come to Jesus' day. Rome is in charge of the then known world. You can read about Babylon and Persia and Greece and the Romans in Daniel's book. Jesus, the Messiah, is born. The Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, 
born of a virgin. The Jews reject him. The Bible says he came to his own, the Jewish people, but his own received him not. They said, away with him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. His blood is on us and our children. I don't think they really understood what they were saying when they crucified Jesus. His blood be on us and our children. Jesus died with this sign over his head. Jesus, the king of the Jews. Jesus tells of the destruction of Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. It's symbolic of the whole nation. And as I've shared with you, the emperor Titus, the Roman emperor, emperor after besieging the city, entered the city. Not one stone was left on another. And the times of the Gentiles began. Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Those were Jesus' words. The nation of Israel was scattered. Israel died as a nation. Why? So that the gospel could be preached to the Gentile nations. This was to be Israel's greatest dispersion or punishment for their greatest national sin, the sin of rejecting Jesus, their Messiah. But out of the loss of Israel, the church won and was born. And the Bible says, I will call them my people and her beloved, which was not beloved. I will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. He's talking about us. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The law died, grace came in. The spirit had been given sparingly. Now it's power poured out on all flesh. Jews were scattered all to the nations all around the world where they prospered. And every year they prayed, next year in Jerusalem. The dream for the rebirth of Israel never, ever died. For 2,000 years, Palestine fell into the hands of the Gentiles. Nomadic Arabs took over. Jerusalem, they built the Mosque of Omar, a multi-million dollar Islamic holy site, and second only to Mecca. The Turks took over for 400 years. Everywhere the Jews went, they were persecuted. In Europe, in Russia, in Germany, but there they also prospered. By the end of the 19th century, Israel was the valley of dry bones that you can read about in Ezekiel chapter 37, please go read it. Jewish sentiment began to rise to rebuild Palestine through the efforts of Zionist Jews, such as Theodore Herzl. A little bit of immigration began. The seeds of nationhood fell on the fertile Palestinian soil. Persecution continued. World War I, the allied forces were losing. And a Jew, Shame Wiseman, invented the explosive called TNT. It turned the tide of the war in the Allies' favor, and they won. The Prime Minister of Great Britain, Lloyd George, asked Dr. Wiseman to name his reward. His reply was, Palestine to be declared the national homeland for the Jewish people. And the miracle of the nation of Israel was on its way. The Balfour Declaration was signed on November the 2nd, 1917, declaring Britain's intent to have sympathy for the Jewish Zionists' desires. Britain was the most powerful nation of its day. Cabinet and Parliament approved, but nothing developed, even though some immigration continued. And then the Jews began to buy up Arab land. 350,000 acres of land was bought from the Arabs under a plan called the Redemption of the Land, mostly with American Jewish money. It was the fulfillment of Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, says the Lord. Agriculture began, and God blessed. Britain reneged on its promise for a Jewish homeland. If you bless the Jews, you will be blessed. If you curse them, you will be cursed. World War II came as the ultimate persecution of the Jewish nation and people. 1939, 17 million people died. 1945, 11 million people died. Six million pe Jewish, Jewish people were, were, were gassed in chambers and were burnt and buried in Jewish concentration camps. And world opinion against Israel changed. Zionism leapt forward. The UN declared them by majority the land of Palestine to be partitioned. The Jews accepted 
the Arabs rejected. The Arabs claimed they would drive all Jews into the sea. Only one solution, total annihilation. And it's the same up until today. Britain left Palestine, which they were looking after, on May the 14th, 1948. And on that day, little four, five foot three, David Ben-Gurion with his lion-like hair stood up and declared the Jewish nation reborn to be called Israel. For 2,400 years, no Jewish flag had flown over Israel until that day. For 2,400, for 1,900 years, the nation had been out of Israel scattered, but God fulfilled his prophecy by bringing them back. The greatest sign of the any moment return of Jesus. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord, your God. The miracle of Israel happened. Unbridled immigration began to the anger of the Arabs who continued to declare total annihilation of the Jewish nation. The bones of Ezekiel's prophecy were coming together. 1917, 25,000 Jews in Palestine. 1937, 430,000. And then 500,000. And then 3 million. Today, Israel has nine and a quarter million inhabitants. Not only was there immigration, there was irrigation. The swamps were dried. Deserts were watered and reclaimed. Reforestation changed the climate and the rainfall. And Israel began to blossom like a rose to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. The wilderness and the solitary places will be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and bloom and blossom as the rose. He, God, shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the whole face of the world with fruit. Today, Israel is the fourth largest exporter of fruit in the world. Arabs began to build up their anger. Oil, money filled their coffers. They purchased arms, specifically mostly from Russia, to destroy Israel. On June the 6th, the holiest Jewish holiday, 1967, the Arabs attacked, determined to wipe Israel into the sea. The wealth and the might of 45 million Arabs against 3 million Jews. It looked like the nation was going to die. Thousands of tanks and heavy armaments were thrown against Israel. The sirens blared over Israel as the nation was delivered by the amazing power of the Israeli Air Force. And this is what the Bible says in Isaiah 31 verse 5. As birds flying, so shall the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. He didn't understand what a jet was, but he saw it like a bird flying. For the first time in 2,000 years, Jerusalem was liberated. And the Jews marched into the holiest of the holy places of, of, of the Jewish nation. For the first time in 2,000 years, they prayed at the, holy, at the wailing wall. For the first time in 2,000 years, the site of the temple was in Jewish hands. Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Then look out, something is about to happen. It was a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that we've, we've heard today. What was God doing? God was kickstarting his unshakable, unchanging covenant plan for restoration and revival for the nation of Israel. He fulfilled his ancient prophecies and confirmed his eternal covenant with Israel. The next phase of God's plan for the ages has begun. The next major event on God's prophetic calendar is, a, is, is about to happen. Jesus is about to come back. Jesus is coming back. We as a church give a lot of money every year to support God's work in Israel because we know that God has a plan for the nation and it's the greatest sign of his return. The largest number of Jews returning <clears throat> to Israel are from Russia. Next is Europe. It's a result of the anti-Semitism in Russia and Europe today. The blame for all the years of communism was placed upon Jews. Marx and Engels and Lenin were all Jews. Communist Russia was run by God-rejecting Jews. Synagogues were turned into bars and gambling halls. Anti-Jewish anti graffiti covers the walls of modern Russia. 
with the fall of Russian communism came a surge of Jewish people who could now flee Russia. And where did they go? To Israel. By their plane loads. And they're still arriving. This is what the Bible says. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. What is the land in the north? Moscow is exactly due north of Jerusalem. This is Bible prophecy about the times that we are living in, our generation. This is the most dramatic sign that Jesus is about to return. <clears throat> What's going to happen ahead of us? Israel is that barometer. What happens to Israel is a sign of the end time scenario. The end, national rebirth of Israel is the greatest end time sign we have. The rebirth of Israel tells us that God's plan for the ages is unfolding exactly as he's declared it would on time. The next event is Jesus is coming back. He will take the church out of the sin sick world and unleash his wrath against Rebellious Israel and the Christ-rejecting Gentile nations. Half of Israel calls themselves secular. It will be a seven-year tribulation period and is clearly outlined and described in the book of Revelation. Please go read the whole book of Revelation <clears throat> in one sitting. Three and a half years of peace and prosperity under one world government controlling the world economy. Three and a half years of the outpouring of God's wrath when the Antichrist turns against Israel. It'll be a plan to bring Israel back to God. It's called a time of Jacob's sorrow in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jesus will return at the end of that time, of the end of that seven-year period, to set up a thousand-year peaceful reign, rule over the earth from Jerusalem. We will reign with him. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be released again, deceive the nations, and Jesus will set up his eternal kingdom, and he will judge the nations. It's here. Our God is a God of prophetic truth. The next event on the calendar, Jesus is coming. The blast of a trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise. And those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord. So let's be careful. <clears throat> or our hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on us like a, unexpectedly like a trap. It'll come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. As your pastor, I'm standing here speaking not only to Watata Church, but to the nation of Uganda. Oh, Uganda, let's turn to Jesus. Are you ready? Let's bow our heads together, shall we? Father, I thank you for your word. You tell the end from the beginning. You're never caught off guard. You announce it. We thank you for this series of messages. We pray that you help us to take it to heart. I pray for those that don't know you, that they would choose you right now. While your head's are bowed, you say, oh, Pastor Gary, I don't know Jesus. If Jesus was to come back, I don't know that I'd be ready, but I want to be. Pray with me. Pray this prayer if you would like to receive Christ today. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've been rebellious, but I'm coming in repentance to you today. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Change my life. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, I want to close this series of messages with one more message about the rapture of the church of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week. Come on, church, let's clap our hands and show Pastor Gary our appreciation. He's shared God's word amazingly. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Gary. And to everyone that has given their life to Jesus, we're so excited for you. For those of you watching on YouTube and on Facebook, there is a link that has just appeared on your screen. Do click it. We'd like to get to know who you are so that we can support you as you walk with Jesus every day. For those of you watching on TV or listening in on radio, Write to us, connect at watorochurch.com. We would like to go alongside you in this journey and help you become that fully devoted follower of Jesus. 
And now friends, it's time for us to give. Time for us to give. And we have the privilege of giving of our finances to support the preaching of God's Word. Hearing these messages about the times that we're living in and being reminded that Jesus is coming back. Friends, it is urgent that we support the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through our generosity, we get to do that. And I promise you, as you give today to support the preaching of the gospel, you will be blessed. And now, let's watch this video that's going to show us more ways that you and I can get involved in this moment of generosity. You can give using mobile money, direct bank transfer, or any banking agent within your community. But also, if you live close to any of our celebration points, you can simply walk over and slip your cash offering into one of the gift boxes. Now, for those using mobile money, let me walk you through the steps you would take. For MTN, dial star 165 star 3 hash and the merchant code is 148775. That is 148775. And for Airtel, you dial star 185 star 4 star 9 hash and the business number is 700,000. That is 7 followed by 5 zeros. For more giving options, check out our website watotochurch.com forward slash give. But you can also use your phone to scan the QR code which will take you straight to the different giving options. And for your Watoto Child sponsorship, dial star 165 star 4 star 4 hash. Then enter the merchant code WCCM in capital letters. The merchant code is WCCM in capital letters. Now as a reference, type the sponsor's full name only. Fill in the amount to be paid and finally fill in your MTN mobile money pin. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for joining us today. If you are enjoying this new sermon series or if you'd like to catch up on our previous sermons, visit our website watotochurch.com. For prayer and counseling, please call any of the numbers you see on your screen or write to connect at watotochurch.com. Registration for our discipleship classes called Equip Streams is still in progress. Our Equip Streams kick off April 2021 and include Adventure in the Word, School of Prayer, and Biblical Financial Stewardship. Visit our website for more details on how you can be a part of it. Remember to follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, and listen to 104.1 Power FM for uplifting programs for you and your family. God bless you and have a wonderful week.